Our Christ went down the, to the river to be baptized, starting his ministry. And as soon as he came out of the water, uh, the skies parted and a dove descended. And I kind of feel like God did that day. I don't feel, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing myself to God in any way, but. You know, I take a day off sometimes, and uh, this is my day off. But today is special. Because my son's preaching for me. This is Remington's, my son, as God says, with whom I am well pleased. so forgive me. Hopefully I'll stop shaking shortly. <laughs> so, uh, it is an extreme honor for me to be here in front of you today. Um, I watched my father pastor for quite some time. And uh, it's no small thing to allow somebody to preach in front of your, of your people. So... Alright, this morning I wanted to uh, first share my testimony. I'm going to kind of pull my soul out of here. Um, first, I'd kind of like to have an interactive thing real quick. Uh, does anybody here have family? Can I see your show of hands? Everybody got family, right? Awesome. Um, who in here has somebody in their family that they worry about constantly and happen to lose sleep over? Several people? Who in here has ever been the cause of their family being worried about them or losing sleep over them? <laughs> um, who in here has ever felt lost and buried under the weight of the world? How many of us that even though we're saved have found ourselves completely lost and wandering in the wilderness? I am that person. I've caused my family much heartache and pain as they knew not what to do to help me sometimes, but simply to pray. Because I was too busy spinning out of control or consumed by my selfishness or pride. Alright, now who in here knows the parable of the prodigal son? It's pretty much one of the most famous ones in the Bible. Um, it's Luke uh, 15, 11 through 32. Now the interesting part about this one is that uh, um, it's funny because I used to jokingly announce my entrance into my parents' house of the prodigal son's return. Uh, the funny part was I didn't actually truly understand the depth of the meaning of that parable or its ironic relevance to my own life. So I'm going to hit on a couple key points and then bring them back together for you. Uh, next I want to talk about the circle of love. Uh, this revelation hit me in the chest one mid-afternoon just as God had personally put his hand upon my chest and stopped me dead in my tracks. And then at Epiphany and Revelation, I understood um, extremely clear, almost instantly, like the sun upon the night, it was love that had personally saved my life. It now supported it and sustained it. In all the areas that I had failed, it had not. In all the ways I had rejected it, it had not. Now, in the light of this, I had no choice but to recognize all that I had done and my responsibility for and in situations I had somehow wrote off is not my fault. Well, the truth to that is that in every situation, we are personally responsible for our part in the circumstances and our part in our decisions. Owning this, however, is a, rarely, is a very strong, however, is rarely our strong point. So the tie-in for this is most of my life I had felt as if my childhood and upbringing wasn't what I thought it should have been. I know, silly, right? I unwillingly held this as a personal debt against my mother, letting it fester into 
an undermining source of resentment and bitterness for years. This in turn caused me to reject her love in many ways secretly. My heart had harbored this bitterness for so long that it clouded everything and tainted it like a stain. Blinding me from the truth of the simplest things that all she ever wanted to do was love me. So the circle of love revelation happened when I was sitting there with my mother in the wake of my recent mess at the Denton Freedom House. And in this particular moment was an absolute moment of clarity by the Spirit when I realized that it was my mother who was the one who was beside me, who had never left me when I had steadily rejected her. She was there by my side in loving support and without fail. I realized in that moment that nothing that I was holding on to could possibly be true or right. And if she had that kind of unfailing and unconditional love for me, and as her son, I owed her the same. And I wept in her arms, and I was the one asking for forgiveness. And for the first time in my life, I truly let everything go, and I was free, free of myself. So I also realized that through my mother's being saved and coming to know God and her walk with Him, that then led her to meet Jay and his support in this walk and his love upon me, which I'll get to shortly. But then how them together, and they're raising my daughter, all while I learned how not to live my life and do things. Only to circle back around, to be supportive, and miraculously give me a lawyer who had played in the band here, um, John, I don't know if anybody here knows John. To handle my legal issues that I had amassed, when I had lost even the basic self-worth of value and love for myself. I was a total mess of brokenness before God. God loved Mama, Mama loved me, Dad loved Mama, and they both loved me unconditionally. And that is, and that is, and that it was their love for God and their walking with Him that came the unconditional love for me. They might claim parenthood, but I see Christ in them and in their love for me. Um, I'd like to go to John 13, 34 through 35. This particular verse, um, I'm not big on addresses, but this particular one uh, had hit me again one night while I was laying in bed contemplating my life and the people in it. John 13, 34 and 35 reads, A new command I give you, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I think that's incredibly important because our love that we put out, that people see, that is Christ in us. And that is the quintessential thing that God is, is, is love. Now to my father, Jay. Has anybody ever known anyone who owed you nothing, nor did they benefit anything by caring for you? Nobody? Some people? A love not owed, but given freely by choice, just because. It's kind of mind-blowing to me. It took me years to wrap my head around it, how a man who owed me nothing could love me and defend me so fiercely, more so in completely eclipsing my biological father, in my opinion. I didn't know what it was or how to process it, or well, that it was my father. In reflection, in the hindsight, there, there are so many conversations that he had had with me that ring true now that then I really didn't understand and often rejected. Until the past 11 months of my real walk with God that I actually now understand. His effect on my life has been ever present since the first time we met, which happened to be on the other side of the glass when I was in state prison back in 04 in the wake of my first major bout with drugs and self-destruction. I honestly accredit him with showing me what it was and what it is to be a real man. Not by words, but by his walk, by example. The way he loved and respected my mother in ways I had never seen any man do. And his warmth and adoration for everyone 
and in his complete faith that never faltered. I wanted what he had. This invisible strength he seemed to have, and no worries, everything will be okay, God's got this kind of attitude, in the face of defying odds, and he was right, and it showed in God's faithfulness. I in no way am saying that my mother had not done the same, but keep in mind this was the first that I had ever seen it from a man. And I was still a young man at the time, and this was even more profound to me. Now to my timeline, I was saved at 15 years old, but never discipled. I didn't really understand what discipling was. And although I had been in the, in the front row of many churches and sat in the front row and watched my father pastor for many years, now I never really got it. And sadly, I used to pride myself as being the stereotypical pastor's kid, defying most rules and wearing the badge of Christianity to boast, but never to walk it out. I call it being a quarter Christian. Punching my ticket for this, for the promised land, but doing nothing to give back to him. My selfishness and pride being the biggest of my battles and the idol of self, my God. I prayed yes and went to church, looking somewhat the part, but having no idea what it meant to walk with him. I honestly used to keep my distance from my parents, never letting them much into my personal life. Because I didn't want to hear the words of sound advice or wisdom as I knew they would conflict with my desires to do whatever I wanted. I used to call my parents goody two shoes and Bible thumpers, thinking that there's no way they can have they can be having any fun at all without indulging in the sinful things that I did daily. Lies of the devil truly, as this I now know is completely false. To walk with God and to know him is to know a peace beyond understanding. A fulfillment and a purpose I had never known. I used to constantly try to reinvent myself, better myself in my own ways, thinking I could figure it out. I'm still amazed daily by God's grace and mercy, as that's the only reason I stand before you today. In the past 13 years, I've run through the gambit of substances, each one masterfully enabling me to destroy my life, as it was at that time. First was cocaine leading to an arrest sentencing for minor theft and homelessness, then alcohol including two DWIs, spread out about every five years. Then came the opiates and being addicted to pain pills for three years, most of which my parents didn't even know. Draining my bank account and savings and also causing my motorcycle accident. It could have easily cost me my life. Then on and off, dabbling in methamphetamines. Never really truly diving into it headlong into it until the last year. In between all this, my success in the car business and thinking that I had found something that identified me and gave me purpose and drive and glamour. The money only helped to fuel my, my ego and pride, and then I took on the role shift of created over creator. The drugs were not always a mainstay, but they were present usually in some form or variation throughout my life. I went through rehab before my prison time and learned a lot about the psychology of why I do things. Psychology, not the spiritual. And thought processes of decision making. But again, these are all things that just help for behavioral modification. Never truly addressing the bigger issue. The deeper issue of why. And I was continually trying to self-medicate or take the edge off the world. No matter what the reasoning or self-justification we tell ourselves, there is only one truth. Mankind is empty and void without God in his life. Without the Spirit abiding in him, we are lost and without compass. God is what calibrates the compass of a man's heart. Drowning him out with the ways of the world and fleshly desires is our own doing, not his. I became increasingly discontent with my life and had, and had my fill of women that to most would seem shameful. My continued thinking of I could do anything and take over the world was fueled by one of the most dangerous and destructive drugs I've ever encountered, methamphetamines. As I had usually only dabbled in it here and there, and only for a week at a time, and so maintaining a semi-functional life as its side effects are some of the more obvious to spot. My erratic behavior and lack of sleep, coupled with my increasing emotional distress and lack of common sense, decision-making, led me to quit my job of seven years at Nissan Greenville. 
Within three months, I had managed to get involved with people whom I would have never been caught associating with prior. Subsequently, I managed to get my entire whole house and belongings stolen from me, along with two trucks, in the middle of me trying to move and start my own business. Ever getting deeper into the underworld, my usage increased and then started to settle a little bit easier to finance my habit. Stealing was never something that I contemplated, nor did I ever do. I did, however, find myself homeless as I was too proud to go home. Or call those who could have and would have actually helped me. My shame for my actions and how far I had fallen led me to stop talking to anyone from the real world who cared. As I wanted no one to see who I'd become. I didn't recognize myself. I was out of control. I walked the streets of a town I had just recently flourished in. My no having a job led to tickets for no insurance, which led to warrants. Expired registrations led to getting pulled over and going to jail for possession charges. Out on Bonnet, I then had an event that will forever change my life. I call this a God event. Has anybody ever had a God event? And you just kind of, psh, yeah. Now the details of what I saw and lived through are not so much important as what I felt. And that God, in the middle of my mess, heard my heart and my spirit calling out to Him. When I couldn't even do it for myself. The things I saw and experienced can't really be explained in reality terms as they were meant for me to experience. Everyone's experiences with God are different, but they all have the same effect. They stop you dead in your tracks and put you on your knees. And that was the day I cried. I cried out and gave in totally to God, fully and without reservation. I was done running from Him, from him and from myself. I just wanted to go home and fill up again. In the midst of this full-on meltdown and spiritual break, I happened to be wearing a bright neon shirt and uh, actually soul crying, as I call it, uncontrollably, as I wandered down a couple of residential streets on foot, apparently striking the attention of some residents who called the cops. They came and talked to me, running my name and seeing I had a ticket warrant. Again, getting searched and getting another possession charge. Now this day is especially important because right before that um, was the first time that I had ever said no to the drug. Flat out said no. I had walked out of a house I had been previously in that night. Spending a month in jail was when my release happened to the Denton Freedom House. Thanks to my parents and John and God again. Just to roll backwards real quick. Um, something about a month before I went to jail the last time, um, I had started to go to my parents and stay there for a week and I would sleep. And they didn't understand. I knew they probably knew something was wrong. Um, my life was upside down. I was completely lost. and. Uh, one day I saw my, my father crying and when you see your father cry and you know it's because of you and he said that he's afraid that his son's going to die and I'm like I'm standing right here I'm not dead I'm not dying but he's definitely afraid for your life I don't care who you are, if you don't have a heart, that's got to do something to you. And it did to me. So he asked if I would go and meet with a gentleman, um, a gentleman named Scott, who is friends with, yes, Russ's son, right? Okay, um, who runs a juvenile um, ranch, I guess, which is similar to the Denton Free Freedom House, which I'll tell you about that in just a minute. So we go over, and I'm thinking my dad wants to put me in rehab, so I'm real reluctant to go. I'm not ready. I wasn't trying to do this. So he takes me over there, and the whole time, I'm honestly thinking about Bolton. Like, I mean, seriously. Um, so we go there, and we talk to this gentleman, and uh, he, Scott had, uh, Scott had been in gangs, Scott had done robbery, Scott had done everything, and lived a hard life. 
And this man was singing God's praise. And I was like, okay. And this dude read my spiritual mail. And I wasn't trying to hear him. But I heard him out for my father's sake. I did it for my father. I still wasn't ready. And it wasn't too long after that that so we left there and he asked me to think about this place called the Den Freedom House. I said, what's the Den Freedom House? He said, well, it's just a Christian-based program. It's a six-month program. It's a live-in program um, where men devote their lives to God and let God work them out rather than a bunch of medication and behavior modification. I'm like, okay, I don't have a problem with the Christian part. I know I need to get my life right. I just didn't know how. I don't think I was ready to commit just quite yet. So whenever God reached down and uh, put his hand upon me in that day that I had that event. Now, keep in mind, this event, I, I saw things that perhaps I was deluded by the drugs that I was still on, but I wasn't that whacked out of my mind that I thought. Um, but I saw things and I felt things. And I think it was more the feel things than it was to see things. Um, I saw my own death. And I walked the streets. It was actually, what day is today? Oh, goodness, it's today the 29th. Yeah. Yeah. All right, does anybody want to hear anything crazy? The day I went to jail was today. Today. <laughs> um, today, a year ago, was whenever God put his hand upon me, and I felt him, and I came home. Um, but in a way I had never really done before. So, <clears throat> the Denton Freedom House, um, so anyway, so I go to jail, and I'm in there, and I don't expect any help. I've already got two charges, I just got two more, which one got dropped, so I, I still have, have three, then I'm going back to court for December 6th, so please keep me in your prayers. Um, I was in there for 34 days, and still trying to figure out what exactly had just happened to me, because I couldn't really explain it, like, none of this stuff really made sense. Um, so the lawyer ended up letting me get out on bond or help me to get on a bond I went to the Denton Freedom House this is a six month in-house completely controlled environment no cell phones, no internet you can write a letter after the first 30 days the family can come visit you on the weekends but you, it's, there's about 40 to 50 men that live in that home um, on about 17 acres in Denton and I mean this, it's literally boot camp for Christians now, you can leave whenever you want. Of course, they're going to encourage you not to. Um, but a lot of men don't make it. A lot of men don't make it. On average, per month, there's maybe one to three graduates. out of, And they can roll through 40 guys in a month. You know, it's just, you really got to want it. But it will change your life if you want it. And if, if nothing else, you get to come in here by Jesus and get fed and you get to do some work. Um, that we do work for the house and the money that comes in goes to help support the house and keep the house up and running. Feeding 40 men is not cheap. Keeping the lights on is not cheap. It is That place runs on straight Jesus and it's it's amazing. Just to go and see that place, it is one of the most anointed and spirit fed places I've ever been in my life. And it changed my life. A man named uh, Jeremy Adams and Karen Adams started that program about 13 years ago by taking in homeless men off the street in Denton. Um, they were blessed with that place by a Denton Bible, um, and they've been running it ever since, and it has done nothing but grow. It's amazing to see what God has done, honestly. And that actually helped to build my faith, because I'm like, if God can do all this, I mean, He can do anything. So, um, I'm now in the Phase 3 graduate program, which is um, I actually live in a house uh, outside of the main house now. Um, I graduated uh, the six-month program, end of May, and had a job two days later. I don't. I I, I buy fix and flip cars on the side, but I actually sell RVs, motorhomes, and campers now. The cool part was the job I got. Uh, two months into the program, we go in on. Saturdays we go and we help move and do jobs for, for the house. Well, this couple that uh, we had gone and moved and I shared my testimony with and they said, well, whenever you graduate, uh, our son owns an RV place and um, 
uh, right outside of Denton. They said, go see him. Maybe there's a job there. Maybe there's not. And I went up there and I was hired. After I graduated, I, hired, I was hired that day. So uh, I have been, and it, it's all God. Like the whole thing is just this giant orchestration of, you know, hearing about the Denton Freedom House and the lawyer who's a Christian lawyer who the DAs were Christian and said, hey, if, if he does what he's supposed to do, the courts will probably be understanding and, and try to work with him. The, this whole thing is just a, a giant Rolodex of, of God's awesome plan. So, yeah. All right. Who here loves Jesus? Keep So, make sure you're still with me. All right. How are we going to get into the Word? Has anybody ever heard the verse, uh, love covers, covers over a multitude of sins? Yes. All right. And love's transforming powers. I'd like to open us up with uh, John 15. We're going to be rocking John pretty much the whole time. John 15, verse 4 through 17. It reads, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that most of us at some point, or more than once, have uh, wandered off the path and found ourselves somewhere we never intended nor did we want to be. And when we look back wondering how this happened, if we're being honest, it's when we took, our, it's when we took over the steering wheel and took a detour somewhere. This is not remaining in Him. He's certainly not the one who gets us lost. Because he's the one who leaves the 99 to come find the one. Wherever we may be, and as many times as it takes. Because he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. In John 15, 4, Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. To be totally honest, I have no idea the depth of that for most of my life. It's incredibly simple. But for most, incredibly hard. Because it requires the thing that God demands and requires from us above all things. Which is faith. Faith to walk in Him. And faith to trust Him. Now these are key factors in every person's walk, no matter who they are or where they are in their walk with Him. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now let's just simmer on that for just a moment. We're pretty talented at making messes of ourselves, right? Separating from the Word and being in it and about it can start off as small compromises and lead to much larger ones. Anyone ever had a run in here that seemed like no matter what you touched and tried to do that it ended in disaster? And the harder you try, the worse it got. Let's cross-reference that now with Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. But in all ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Trust, faith, love equals hope. 
All right, we're going to jump back to John 5, 12 through 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. These truths were shown to me by my family and friends in their walk and in their love and in their faithfulness to me. Especially in my darkest hours, which is obviously when I needed them the most. But it's when I thought I deserved it the least, and in fact, not at all. Shame can make people think they are unworthy of such love, but we are all unworthy of God's love. That's the beauty of it all. God's love for us is so grand, so incomprehensible, that He sent His only Son down to the earth and be persecuted so that He could show us how to live right by example and then to save all our souls and give us the way back to Him. A way that can never be stripped away no matter how many lies we listen to. In closing, I just wanted to visit the last part of John 15, 16 through 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in His name. This is my command, love each other. Now we didn't get into fruit today, but it's a process of going and walking it out and living a godly life and making an impact. Doing God's work and being an active vessel. Your impact and actions are the fruit. A light in a dark, dark world. His light is in you. So I hope you can, can see this, the whole love thing that kept rocking me. Um, especially whenever you think that you're unworthy to have it. And people keep giving it to you. It did something to me. It, it showed me that, and God showed me actually, that that's His kind of love. He loves us all so much. It doesn't matter how far off the beaten path we get. He'll come right down there and pick you up. And He'll drag you right back. And I think that is what we all need to remember. And if there is anybody in your life that is struggling, whether it be with, it, it could be anything. We, we are all the same. We all are over. I, <clears throat> I wrote a poem earlier this month. Um, it's called Running in Place. We are all running, running the same race, in different places, with different faces, but still the same race. Fighting the same battles, enduring the same strifes, the same struggles, as there's no battle new to man that we now face. So often we forget our place, consumed by this race, like we're lost in space without compass or bearing, without purpose or direction. This race against time, this thing called life and all that we dream it to hold, all headed in the same places in life and death, though only in death do we truly learn our fate, some only to realize it's too late, while others get to enter the early gates. He gave his life for us to have it, that we might learn to find our place in him, our identity in Christ. Through our faith in Him, our only refuge and resting place. You might keep this in mind, that this is not a race, but a walk. A walk to be remembered. Keeping in reverence and remembrance our purpose in this place. To love another. To love one another and each other. Building each other up in the body of Christ. Guys, it has been an extreme honor for y'all to... Listen and give me your attention while I pour my heart out. I want to honor my, my mother and father for loving me, my daughter, su supporting me. You guys have been my rock and my strength, and right underneath you is God. So you're standing on them, and I'm standing on y'all, and we're all standing together. And um, we will weather this storm. Thank you so much, guys.